Welcome back to the sessions on transmission and distribution. So, in the previous session, we had discussed about the history of evolution of transmission systems. We saw how Edison's first power system, which was DC, slowly got transformed into AC systems with the invention of the transformers. We saw that it is necessary to transmit at higher voltages to improve the efficiency of the system. Because of the inability of DC voltages to be stepped up, the DC power systems gave way to AC power systems. The other great invention we saw was that of the AC motors which completely sealed the path forward for AC power systems. We also saw the various transmission voltages and the generator voltages being between 11 to 33 kV, how they are stepped up to higher voltages and different stages of the stepping down of the voltages. Finally, every consumer is supplied with the power required at the respective voltages which their apparatus needs. Now, we will move forward from there and see more about the transmission and distribution. So, this is Professor Umar Rao bringing you the lecture series on module number 1 of the course on transmission and distribution. So, the voltage from the primary transmission levels is stepped down to a range between 132 to 33 kV, where industrial load centers take the power at that particular voltage. And in India, the standard distribution voltages are 66, 33, 22 and 11 kV and finally, at the residential levels, it is 400 by 230 volts. So, the 400 is 3 phase and 230 is single phase. Besides, you also have intermediate voltages of 6.6 kV, 3.3 kV, 2.2 kV etcetera. So, these distribution lines are drawn as per the requirement of the local industries. So, you can see that the entire power system operates at different voltages at different levels and what separates this voltage levels? It is the transformers. Okay. So, now you can just see this is again a very simplified uh, picturization of the entire system. So, I have the power plant generator and then we have a step up transformer which will step up the voltage as per the transmission requirements. This voltage could be 220 kV, 400 kV, 735 kV, whatever is the required voltage. And then you have the towers. So, they are the physical supporting structures. We will see more of these in the coming sessions of the transmission lines. And these transmission lines you can see they carry power over large distances. And then we have neighborhood transformers which step down the voltage to required level. And you have the distribution lines which finally give supply the power to the consumer. So, the consumers could be ordinary domestic consumers, commercial consumers like hospitals, schools and shops etcetera, industrial consumers requiring voltages at different levels. So, this step down will happen at different levels and the supply will be as per the voltage requirement of the consumer. Now, if you look at India, you just see from the last about a decade or more, there is 
a gradual increase in the installed capacity. Rapid industrialization and the penetration of electronic goods into everybody's lives and the power requirement due to lot of urban urbanization of rural areas. So, all this has led to a tremendous demand from the consumers. Naturally, the generators have to step up their generation as per the requirement, otherwise we always have a deficit. So, you can see that in the year 22, we had a whooping almost 400 gigawatts of installed capacity. Okay. Now, let us just see a brief outlay of what the Indian power sector looks like. So, the apex body is the Central Electricity Authority or CEA. This is directly under the Ministry of Power. We discussed in the previous session that we need to have a standardization within a country. Okay? Now, if you look at a power system, so you saw we have generation, transmission, distribution. Now, the generation is not confined to one generator or two generators. We have a number of generators operating. Now, what sort of generators are these? These are all alternators, AC generators. And you all know that AC generators have to operate in synchronism if we connect them in parallel. So, all these generators are actually operating in parallel and supplying pumping power to the grid, pumping power to the grid. It is like the network you have seen in circuit theory. Okay? So, the grid forms an electrical network and through this network, the power is transferred to different loads, through different paths, to different paths. Now, if we have to operate the system in synchronism, I cannot have each one operating as per their will and fancy. Okay? So, everybody has to follow some regulations and we need one regulating body to dictate the code of conduct, we can say that is called as the grid code. So, you have to operate the voltages within this range, you have to keep the frequency with this, this range, you cannot have more deviation. So, the quality of the system should be this much. This is the maximum the voltage can fall below the prescribed level and so on and so forth. So, without these regulations, what would happen is each operator would operate to maximize their profit. After all, it is a business. After all, it is a business and each operator would operate to maximize the profits which would not be good for the health of the power system. Therefore, Every country will have one, I would say, apex regulating body, which would set the grid code, what is the code of conduct for the grid to behave in the particular geographical area under their jurisdiction. So, in India, it is the Central Electricity Authority known as CEA and it is directly under the Ministry of Power of Central Government of India. It is the main regulatory body. I suggest all of you just visit their website to get an idea of the humongous size of the Indian power system. So, we have different generating companies. So, we have centrally owned and state owned. So, you have the National Thermal Power Corporation NTPC, National Hydro Power Corporation NHPC, these are all central government companies, nuclear power corporation and then you have the national grid operator, power system operation corporation limited POSOCO which has been renamed as grid controller of India. So, earlier we used to call it as POSOCO, now it is renamed as grid controller of India and it is directly under the ministry of power. Then we have the regulators, the central regulatory commission. Electricity Regulatory Commission. Then every state has its own Electricity Regulatory Commission 
For example, we have Karnataka Electricity Regulatory Commission, KERC in Karnataka. And you have power trading companies for exchange of power from one state to the other state. So, this is not exhaustive, this list is not exhaustive, this is just to give you an idea about how many people are involved in giving us electricity at our doorstep as, power, as per our need and as per our requirement. Now, this roughly is how the Indian grid looks like, it is a huge one, so you can see here. So, the Indian grid looks like this. You can see there are four regions, five regions, sorry. So, you have the southern grid covering the southern states, then you have the western and we have the eastern grid and the northern grid and the northeastern grid. So, these are called as the regional grids. Okay. So, each of these will have generation, some centrally owned, some state owned, some private owned and so on. Now, the profile of every region is different. Okay. So, if you look at northeast, they have quite a few power resources, hydel power resources, but they are not highly industrialized. So, the demand is less. If you look at the southern states, they are highly industrialized and they guzzle energy, require lot of energy. Okay. So, if you look at the different regions, each of the regions has a different I would say load profile and different generation profile. So, we need to have policies and a strategy for exchange of power from one region to other region. And within the region, we need a strategy for exchange of power from one state to another state. For example, the southern grid may borrow power from the eastern grid, because eastern grid often has a surplus of generation and the southern grid always suffers from a lack of enough power. Similarly, within the southern grid, the states of Andhra Pradesh, Karnataka, etc. may mutually, you know exchange power and so on. So, now you can see why it is so important to have proper regulations in order, else the entire grid operation will go haywire and would even result in a massive blackout. And we have one national grid. What is the national grid? So, the national synchronous power grid interconnects all the five regional grids. It did not happen suddenly, nowhere in the world large grids came up, because I told you the grid formation of the grid is not just about drawing a transmission line or a distribution line from one end to the other end. It is all about protection, about sensing faults and it is, it is about the ability to run in synchronism, ability to exchange large amounts of powers regulations, so many aspects come. So, all over the world if you study the grid growth, it would have grown gradually and the same thing happened in India. So, the five regional grids, in 1991, the northeastern and eastern grids were connected, connected means synchronized. So, at some border area, the grids will become synchronized, they operate as one grid. Once you synchronize, you can have exchange of power. Then in 2003, the western grid was connected with this grid. So, what happened in 2003? Western, northeastern and eastern grids were operating in synchronism. Okay. And in August 2006, the northern grid was also interconnected. So, four regional grids were operated as one single grid and it was called as the new grid at that time. And we had a famous blackout in 2012. Okay. So, at that time South India was not at, southern grid was not at synchronized with the rest of the nation. That is 
during the blackout of 2012. So for those of you who are interested, you can go back and read about the blackout. It would be an excellent case study in power system operation. Then on 31st December 2013, the southern grid was also connected to the central grid and we have now one nation, one grid, one frequency. So you may ask me, I told you that the Indian frequency is 50 hertz, now why I am saying one frequency specifically? It just means that though I specify 50 hertz, right, if the generation is more than the demand, that particular region would be operating at a higher frequency. If the demand is more, it would be operating at a lesser frequency, okay. And this was actually one of the reasons the inability to operate two grids in synchronism. So now once we operate as one single grid, we need to have very strict adherence to the frequency. So it lies in a very narrow band between 49.9 to 50.05 hertz. That is a small band, only that much of variation is permitted in the frequency operation. Now we saw on the central level, we saw the national grid. Now let us come to the state governments. So different governments, different states, we have the state electricity boards, they may go with different names. So these electricity boards today, they are what we call as unbundled entities. Unbundled entities means the generating companies, they are called as GENCOs, that is the generating companies. The transmission companies form a group and the distribution companies form another group. So earlier, the electricity board had a control on all these. Even now the regulatory framework is controlled, but they are separate accounting entities. So the onus of responsibility has been clearly defined for each of these sectors, the generating, transmission and distribution. So this is called as unbundling. The other is called as a vertical structure, vertical structure. So this is called as unbundling. Then we also have state electricity regulatory commissions which have to adhere to the CEA guidelines. They can't arbitrarily form their own guidelines. So they monitor the grid operation of the particular state. And we have what are called as IPPs, independent power producers. Today we have many IPPs especially because we have a lot of renewable energy owned by private parties. So you have huge solar farms wind farms and some thermal plants, some gas based plants etc. all owned by private parties and depending on the state in which they are located, there are different ways of pricing their power and how they connect to the grid and so on. So this is called as functional unbundling. So you have the generating companies, you have the generating companies. They are responsible for power generation and setting up of new generating stations. Then you have transmission companies, they manage the entire transmission within the state. And if any bulk power has to be purchased, I told you supposing this, you know we want the state of Karnataka wants to borrow power from Tamil Nadu or vice versa or say state of Karnataka wants to supply somewhere there is a deficit, we want to share our power and so on. So all these management of bulk power supply and wheeling, wheeling means transport, transferring power from one area to other area that is called as wheeling and the grid operation, all this is maintained by the transmission corporations or companies and then you have the distribution companies, they manage the distribution system that is to the customers at the, at the lower voltage levels to the different customers. And supposing there is a new customer, let us say a new industry is coming, say near Mysore. So how do, how the power has to be given to them? So the available distribution system cannot take care of it. So how do we expand? So this sort of planning and design and all for the customer, at the customer level is done by the distribution companies, okay. And retail sales, that is to the industries and so on, consumers. So in Karnataka, just a brief history, 
So the KEB, Karnataka Electricity Board was formed in 1957 and in 1999 we had the KPTCL which was responsible for the transmission of power in the entire state of Karnataka and also for the construction of stations and transmission lines, substations, transmission lines and maintenance of 400, 200, 110 and 66 kV substations. So many new lines and substations were added and existing substations were modified in the transmission network. So the transmission companies normally operate with a license from the regulatory commission of the particular state. And we have unbundled distribution companies. So you have the Bescom supplying the Bangalore region, Bangalore Electricity Supply Company, the Mangalore Electricity Supply Company, Hubli Electricity Supply Company, Gulbarga Electricity Supply Company, Chamundeshwari Electricity Supply Company. These are the five distribution companies in Karnataka. So, Again, this list of bodies is not exhaustive, okay. There are other more, lot more other parties who see that the entire grid is operated in a very disciplined fashion. Now, let us just take a quick recap of whatever we had done in the introduction. Which invention steered the power system to adopt AC? If you are asked this question, which single invention topmost, the answer would be the transformer right, which facilitated a very easy change in the voltage level. Number two, what are the drawbacks of DC power system? So, there is majorly one drawback that is the lack of a device to step up the DC voltage and this one drawback causes the other drawbacks, namely increased heat loss, I squared R loss because of which the DC was limited to smaller distances. The DC power system, not transmission, the power system, entire system power is with DC. What is the apex body for electric power regulation and operation in India? It is the CEA. So again reiterate, please go and visit their website. You will get a lot of information about the Indian power sector. And I am sure as an Indian, you would all be very proud of the humongous nature of our grid and how beautifully we operate it. Next, what is the national grid of India? So that is the grid where all the five regional grids have been synchronized. All the five regional grids have been synchronized. So what is a DISCOM? DISCOM is a distribution company. Okay. Now, what is unbundling? So, unbundling is where the accountability and operation of generation, transmission and distribution are segregated. So, bundle, bundle means put together. When they are all together in one, you have a vertical structure and when you unbundle, you have three horizontal structures. Okay. What is the frequency of utility voltage in India? Simple, it is 50 hertz with a small deviation permitted by the grid code. Now the last question, Faraday is called the father of electricity, can you justify that? If anybody asks you this, you should say yes, because the one revolutionary discovery was that of electromagnetic induction, which gave birth to a whole lot of other inventions. So, Faraday himself may not have invented the other products, but his discovery was the one which led others to think of how to use it. So, he is rightfully called as the father of electricity. Okay. So, with this we have a recap of the general introduction and also some specific uh, things about the Indian grid. So, now let us move on. What are the next learning objectives we have? What are the advantages of higher voltage transmission, HVAC, high voltage AC, extra high voltage AC, ultra high voltage AC and HVDC? And how do we interconnect different loads, the feeders, the distributors and the service mains? So these two objectives we will try to meet in the next uh, couple of minutes. 
So, let us retrospect and see why do we need to transmit at high voltages. I had already told you that. You just see here, we know the power is equal to V i cos phi in A c single phase. So, three phase it is only scaling root 3, the total three phase power would be root 3 V l i n cos phi, right. Therefore, the current is P by V cos phi, okay. Now, P is determined by the load. So, you have to give the load that much of power. So, let us say I con uh, connect an in industry to a distribution substation. So, the industry let us say requires some say 10 megawatts. I have to supply the industry 10 megawatts. I cannot do anything about it. And the power factor cos phi is the power factor of the load. So, that also is not under my control, right. Though there are regulations about how they have to maintain the power factor, but still cos phi is determined by the load center. So, what is under the control of the utility is the voltage, right. Power and cos phi are not under their control. So, the voltage is under their control. And therefore, you can see from the second equation that for the same power with higher voltages, the current will be lesser. This is a very important factor. So, the same amount of power can be transmitted at high voltages with lesser current, okay. So, immediately what are all the consequences? This is the primary effect. What are all the consequences? Once the current is reduced, right, the conductor thickness can reduce because it is current carrying capacity. I can use a current, a conductor of lesser current carrying capacity. Therefore, a reduced current leads to a reduced conductor volume. Since the line current is reduced, conductors of lesser current carrying capacity can be used. So, the volume is reduced for the same line length. This is a direct consequence of the first. You will see that everything is a consequence of the first statement that we need lesser currents for the same power to be transmitted. Again, what does the lesser current lead to? A reduction in the power loss. So, the power loss is proportional to I squared R. Therefore, I reduces, I squared R also reduces. So, the power loss reduces. Now, since the loss is reduced, what happens to the efficiency? Automatically, the efficiency will improve, okay. An improved voltage regulation. What is voltage regulation? So, in engineering, regulation always refers to a change, okay. So, voltage regulation means change in the voltage. So, when I say change, I have to say change between two parameters. Change is always when you have two parameters. So, the voltage regulation is defined as the sending end voltage minus receiving end voltage divided by the sending end voltage. So, normally the voltage regulation is expressed in percentage. So, I can multiply this by 100. So, this would be the percentage change. Now, would you want a low value or a high value? Obviously, I want a low value. Because if I have a high value, what does it mean? When will this quantity be high is when the numerator is high. Numerator is high means the difference between the sending end and receiving end voltages is large, which is not desired. So, to have a voltage of say 230 volts, I need a much higher voltage if my regulation is large. So, in operating any system, our aim should always be to have as low a voltage regulation as possible. So, in the subsequent courses in power systems, you will see how you can improve the voltage regulator and you have to improve the voltage regulation. Now, this is the voltage regulation. Now, what is the receiving end voltage? The receiving end voltage is the sending end voltage minus the drop in the line. So, we discussed in the previous section that any time you have current flowing through a conductor, there is a voltage drop in the conductor. So, there is a voltage drop in the transmission line, right. So, the receiving end voltage is the sending end voltage minus the drop. And what is the voltage drop? I into Z. 
So, naturally when current reduces the drop in the line also reduces therefore, the receiving end voltage will be better. So, again the regulation improves. So, can you just see that all these are based all the other advantages of high voltage is based entirely on one single effect which is the reduction of current at higher voltages of transmission. That is why I repeated so many times that it was a transformer which revolutionized the power system and made AC more popular than DC till it eventually wiped out DC power systems. Installation cost per kilometer also reduces with increased voltage because of the same reasons because of the above. If the current is lesser, the protection you require would be lesser so on. The number of circuits and hence the land required to lay the transmission line decreases with increase in voltage because you can transmit more power at higher voltages. So, naturally we have what is called as the right of way cost. So, you can't arbitrarily go and lay transmission lines everywhere, no. The lines cross somebody's area, somebody's land, so you have to pay for it. The authority, the government authority or whoever is laying the lines must buy it or lease it from the person who owns the land. This is called as right of way. That cost also will reduce. And in fact, this right of way cost is one of the main barriers for massive expansion. You can't rapidly go on expanding. It takes a lot of time. There are so many regulations for acquisition of land from the owners and for laying of lines. And the, depending on the voltage, you cannot have residence within a certain vicinity and so on. So, you see we have a number of advantages by transmitting at higher voltages. And so, you should not be surprised that from 11 kV, 33 kV, we went on and on 765 kV and today we are looking at 1100 kV and maybe even more. So, 33 kV to 230 kV, we generally call it as high voltage AC systems. Then 400 kV to 765 extra high voltage AC systems, 765 and above fall under ultra high voltage, ultra high voltage UHV AC. And in India, in Bina, in Madhya Pradesh, we have a 1200 kV test station. And the Vardha Aurangabad line operates at 1200 kV. And today we have HVDC transmission lines operating at voltages up to 800 kV and plan to go up to 1000 kV. Now I have a simple question. If the voltage is doubled for the same power transmission, what is the loss? Okay. So let us say I am transmitting a power at 33 kV. So, instead of transmitting at 33 kV, I transmit at 66 kV. So, I have doubled the voltage. What will happen to the loss? So, you see voltage comes in the denominator for the current. Okay, Power is same. So, if I double the voltage, current will become half. Right. So, whatever is the current drawn at 33 kV, half of that will be drawn at 66 kV. And the loss is proportional to I squared. So, it will be proportional to half squared that is one fourth. Therefore, if I double the voltage, the loss gets reduced by one fourth. So, you can see how much advantage I have by transmitting at higher voltages. Second question, why is voltage regulation improved with higher voltage for transmission? Because I have lesser drop. With higher voltage of transmission, the current is reduced and the drop is proportional to Iz. So, the receiving end voltage would be higher than what it would be at a lesser voltage of transmission and hence the regulation improves. So, these small questions in between for is for you to recap whatever we have done. Okay. So, we saw all the advantages, I have just listed them here, we will quickly see that. EHV AC I told you is 200 kV to 400 uh, kV and above is extra high voltage. What are the advantages of EHVAC? More reduction in current because I am going higher than 400 kV 
and again leads to loss losses reduction, reduction in conductor volume, improvement of efficiency, improvement of regulation, increase in the capacity of the line and due to all these lesser line cost and you can add more parallel lines, right? Because I can have lesser number of lines with higher voltages, so I can add more parallel lines in the same area, in the same area. And all these will lead to a significant reduction in the cost per kilometer. So, these are all the advantages of EHVAC systems. Now, are there any disadvantages? Definitely, definitely very high voltages you have, you will have high electric fields around the conductor. So, the first disadvantage is what we call as corona. Corona is you know when the air around the conductor breaks down. So, there is a potential gradient for the air to break down. When this is exceeded, the air around the conductor breaks down. So, a very beautiful way to see corona is when you pass in the night by a train or a bus and you see high voltage lines, you will see a sort of a blue light around the line, completely the length of the line. That is the air breaking down, the air becomes conducting. So, which means that it will have higher losses. So, we will see in the section on corona deeply how corona is affected and radio interference. So, it will interfere with the communication signals because of the field of the high voltage. Difficulty in erection, safety, the insulation required. So, cost of protection will go up and increased cost of associated equipment that was that is what I told you transformers, switch gear, switch gear means all the protection and other protection equipment. And very high voltages the electrostatic effects on human beings and other animals and the problem of insulation. I have to pro provide suitable insulation between the ground and the line. So, these are all some of the disadvantages of EHV AC lines. Now, UHV transmission ultra high voltage that is beyond 400 kV, it can be very economical and in addition the main problem here is right of way. Because Obviously, I cannot lay such a high transmission line, I cannot take it through any residential area. It has to be outside the city, in the forest area. So, as human beings, we may be very selfish, I do not want to be harmed, but what about the animals in the forest? So, you need to clear, so you will have problem from environmentalists, climatic changes and so on. So, UHV, AV, UHV AC lines, one of the major issue is acquisition of land for laying the lines. Okay. So, it is UHV AC is 765 kV and above and for D DC transmission it is 800 kV or more. So, UHV transmission systems have been built in China since 2009 for both AC and DC. And India is set to deploy 1200 kV power transmission lines on commercial basis, making it one of the highest voltage levels in the world. And boosting India's successful implementation is the 1200 kV test station in Bina in Madhya Pradesh under a public private partnership initiative of the erstwhile power grid corporation of India. So, public private partnership means in such projects there will be a private party like say a Reliance or Adani power or Tata power or some power body in conjunction with the government could be the state or the central and they form a partnership. So, there will be some understanding how much of cost is to be borne by both, how the profits are to be shared etcetera etcetera. That is called as PPP, public private partnership. So, some advantages of UHV AC transmission, they have all the advantages of EHV. So, where the energy resources are very far from load centers, see in big countries like India, China, USA, Australia. So, they are all huge, you know very the geographical boundary is very large. So, when the distance 
of transmission is very high. Then ultra high voltage gives you an economical way of transmitting the power. The construction of new and efficient power generation plants far from domestic area is possible with the implementation of UHV AC. And it allows the integration of renewable energy. What happens right now we have a problem with solar and wind right because I may have a desert which has very good capacity for generation of solar power but it may be at a high distance. So, it may not be very economical for me to transmit at lower voltages. So, this ultra high voltage technology enables you to integrate the renewable energy into the systems where the renewable energy sources are located far away from the load centers. So, these are all some of the advantages. Now, what are the drawbacks? So, you have security and reliability issues. UHV lines transfer huge amounts of bulk power and connectivity is very intense. This makes it difficult to restrict the effects of faults to smaller areas, it will permit. Okay. So, the chances of a blackout is higher, when the voltage level is higher, the chances of a blackout is higher. And of course, we spoke of the environmental issues, the effect on animals, the effect on land, the effect on climate, on human beings and so on. And they are very, very expensive because of the associated equipment, the insulators, the transformers, the protection, everything will be very expensive. And therefore, you know, we do not have too many ultra high voltage lines, though it does have some advantages. See efficiency and profit is not the only motive all the time. So, now let us come back to DC. So, we welcomed back DC after throwing out DC in favor of AC in the early 19th century, we welcomed back DC in the later part of the 20th century. And the reason I told you was the power electronic technology. So, the power electronic technology permitted us to have high voltage converters both rectifier and inverter. So, we could convert from AC to DC that is rectify at the sending end and transmit DC and at the receiving end convert back the DC to AC that is inverter. So, this was not possible with the original old like mercury arc rectifiers though they did have in the earlier HVDC systems, it was limited. But the advent of power electronics opened up vistas for rapid expansion of HVDC transmission lines. So, the first commercial HVDC transmission system began service in 1950 between Swedish mainland and the island of Gotland about 96 kilometers offshore. In India, the first HVDC transmission system was commissioned in 1990 between Rihad and Dadri near Delhi. It was a stretch of 814 kilometer long, bipolar means you have both positive and negative with respect to the ground, bipolar overhead line and the transmission voltage was 500 kV and the power was 1500 megawatts which is quite a large amount of bulk power. So, coming to Karnataka we had the first HVDC transmission system in 2003 between Talchar to Kolar and the transmission voltage was again plus or minus 500 kV and with a capacity of 2000 megawatts and this time you can see the distance was almost double 1450 kilometers. Now, this 2000 megawatt has been upgraded to 2500 megawatts. A high capacity that is plus or minus 800 kV, 6000 megawatts bipolar line is being implemented from Bishwanath in Assam to Agra in Uttar Pradesh through West Bengal. So, you can see India is no less and we are also making rapid strides in HVDC transmission. 
Now, we can watch a beautiful video of India's 215 kilometer long high voltage direct current line. This video is available on YouTube and I thank YouTube for making this available to the general public. I think that video must have uh, you know shown you what India can do and that we are no way behind the other so called developed power sectors. We have a private enterprise in the HVDC system. So, the link I have given you can give you a write up on the project. 
and uh, I request you all to go through the link to get more details about the project. So, it is a bulk power highway with a capacity to transmit 2500 megawatts from Gujarat to Haryana in a single loop. So, it is around 1000 kilometers funded by Adani Power Limited at 400 kV HVDC transmission. So, if you read this, you will get an idea about the amount of work, the different components involved and how a whole project takes place, a whole outlay of an HVDC transmission takes place. Now, these are some of the very, very popular HVDC lines in India. As I told you, the first one was from Rihand to Dadri and then you have in uh, Vindhyachal, then Chandrapur, Ramagundam. So, you can see that there are a few smaller ones like 100 megawatts, but we do have 1000 megawatts and uh, you know the systems are growing. Talchar to Kolar was the first one which with HVDC transmission to uh, Karnataka and then now we have the latest one with 2500 megawatts and then you have a Champa Kurukshetra with 6000 megawatts and northeastern region with Agra in the 6000 megawatts. So, you can see that you know we have a lot of HVDC transmission lines in India. Each of them are available for you if you want more information and it would be a very interesting reading to go through and see how the technology has progressed. So, okay, we welcomed back HVDC because we had power electronics to help us with the converters, the rectifier and the inverter. So, what are the advantages of using HVDC? Why did I want to come back to HVDC? So, the first thing is you want to synchronize two asynchronous grids. For example, when one of the HVDC stations was built in a place called Gajuaka, that is between Orissa and Andhra Pradesh border. Orissa was operating at a higher frequency and Andhra Pradesh was operating at a lower frequency. Therefore, I cannot synchronize two grids that are operating at different frequencies. So, what was done? What do you do? You change the frequencies at both the ends. Supposing there is a grid operating at a higher frequency, I convert it to DC, transmit DC and then give it to the second region and change there the frequency to the level of the second grid. So, this was one of the first advantages, but today this is no longer a, a good reason because we do not operate different regions at a wide margin of frequencies, but this was one of the reasons why HVDC became very popular connection of two asynchronous grid. Okay. Then the second one is long distance water crossings. So, whenever you know you have a huge body river or so, then the AC lines the length of the cable you do not you run cables through through the water body that is limited in AC because of the losses in the cable and DC became very useful in such cases. So, over long distance water crossings DC was preferred to AC. The next biggest advantage is controllability. The biggest advantage is in HVDC systems, we can control the power. So, this reduces the difficulty of uncontrolled or unscheduled power. The second advantage is the ground can be used as one of the return conductors, can be used as a return conductors. And in DC, you do not have reactive power loss, I squared x loss is not there. We do not have skin effect. Skin effect is an effect where the effective resistance of a conductor is increased because of the frequency. Okay? And Ferranti effect is where the capacitance of the line causes high voltages at the receiving end during no load. We will see more of this in module number 2. 
and we don't have any problem of stability because there is no synchronization, there is no frequency to synchronize and you have lesser corona and radio interference when compared to AC and therefore, the line cost is reduced in HVDC. So, we will end this session here and continue from here in the next session.